Welcome to Conversations with Father Bosco, a webinar series hosted by the Office of Mission and Ministry and the Georgetown University Alumni Association. Thank you for taking time out of your day to join us for this session, The Problem of God Today with Father Peter Folan. Our host, Father Mark Bosco, is Vice President for Mission and Ministry at Georgetown University and holds an appointment in the Department of English. A native of St. Louis, Missouri, Father Bosco joined Georgetown in 2017 after 14 years at Loyola University, Chicago, where he was a tenured faculty member and served as director of the Hank Center for the Catholic Intellectual Heritage. As a scholar, Father Bosco has focused much of his work on the intersection of theology and art, specifically the British and American Catholic literary tradition. He has published on a number of authors, including the writers Graham Greene and Flannery Flannery O'Connor, and is the co-director and co-producer of the new feature-length documentary on Flannery O'Connor. This award-winning film will have its television premiere on, the, on PBS American Masters in March. I'm Kelly Young, an Associate Director of Strategic Engagement and Alumni Relations, and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. As a quick reminder, today's session is being recorded and the recording will be shared via our follow-up email. You may also use the questions section of your webinar control panel to submit questions for Father Bosco and Father Folan during their discussion. Without further ado, I'm pleased to turn things over to Father Mark Bosco. Well, thank you, Kelly. And just for anybody who's out there, it's March 23rd for Flannery on PBS. American <laughs> Masters. Always want to kind of, you know, allow uh, our Hoyas and uh, alumni to hear uh, and to see uh, see the Flannery O'Connor film. So the film will be on that. I think that whatever that March 23rd is, we do we do now know the date. So so thank you, Kelly. And it's good to be back in conversations here now. Uh, we're doing conversations with our Jesuits, particularly our newer Jesuits who are uh, have come to, to uh, Georgetown to teach or to work in ministry. Um, so I'm really happy to um, be here with Peter Folan, who is a, a great uh, Jesuit brother, colleague, and has uh, come in and in many ways um, uh, has hit the, the ground running uh, in the midst of even COVID. So we're really happy to have you, uh, Peter. Thanks for joining Thanks. us today. Thanks for having me. Can you maybe say a little bit, I mean, you're in a tenure track position uh, in the theology department uh, that started in the fall of 2019. Um, you did your doctorate at BC, Boston College, at other Jesuit university, you know. Um, <laughs> can you just tell us a little bit of the history of your life coming to the Jesuits? What attracted you to the Society of Jesus? And um, what's part of that intellectual and spiritual journey that brought you to Georgetown? Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Great question. And thanks for having me today. It's a, a delight to to talk with you. I, yeah, I mean, you know, I had got my doctorate from Boston College, another Jesuit institution. But in a way, really, my vocation to the Society of Jesus began right here at Georgetown. I, I wasn't a student at Georgetown before I entered, but right out of college, I moved to Washington, D.C., and I worked for a year at the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. And I was a high school teacher for two years over in Prince George's County at a Catholic high school there. But I had always kind of been thinking about being a priest in some way. Ever since I was a kid, I grew up on Long Island. And I suppose some Jesuits as a child, so Jesuits from Fordham University would do some supply at my parish. But really the first Jesuit I met as an adult was Otto Hentz. Because oh. I, I had the great, I know, I know. I had the, maybe some of you have heard of him. Because <laughs> uh, I, I had this great fortune of, of living with three roommates, all Hoyas, some of them might even be on this call right now, right when I was out of college. And one of them in particular knew Otto very well and was part of a dinner group with Otto when he was a senior. And it was our first year out of college. And so he said, I should come and meet this guy. And so I got to know Otto a little bit and having thought about being a priest and I worked with the Jesuit at the Bishop's Conference, knew a couple other Jesuits, got to meet some young, not that they weren't young, but young Jesuits as in scholastics. And, and for me, it just really started to kind of press this question of, you know, I've thought about being a priest before, now I know these Jesuits, and is this the time that I, I, I want to try, give this a shot? Yeah. So I, I kept working for those years, but, you know, the draw was the, the way the Jesuits took seriously education, both educational ministries, but also the education of their own members, the work with the poor, the work with the marginalized, and, and that really kind of lit a fire under me. And so in 2002 or so, I, I started to move into application after having been in discernment formally with the Jesuits for a couple of years. And then I entered in 2003 and it's been, uh, it's been fantastic. I mean, I, maybe the, the one thing I could say is I, I'm happy as a Jesuit, which I think is, is something that I would hope everyone could say about his or her vocation, whatever it might be. 
Yeah, it is true that you know, not to to, to, to you know to uh, praise the society, but there is an adventure about becoming a Jesuit. The training, the the, the places you go, the people that you meet, the people that you serve. Uh, there is this kind of an adventure to it. And uh, someone once says, well, "Would you ever want to leave the society?" Jesus, I said, "No." They, I mean, they're going to have to pull me out if they want me to right. go. That's right. That's uh, right. That's really it, a, of course. Yeah, and please. A lot of those initial things, the, the the adventures and, you know, going to join the novitiate and then studying philosophy and teaching philosophy at the University of Scranton, where I was studying theology. It was a lot of that study that really helped bring me where I am now, kind of the intersection of philosophical and theological questions. In, in many ways, it's kind of what's going on in systematic theology, the area that I specialize in. It's been, yeah, it's been a really exciting adventure and to do all sorts of different things and and to be back, let me tell you, Mark, when I, I came to interview here in the theology and religious studies department and to see sitting at the table during my job talk, Otto Hentz was just <laughs> I, it was a, a symmetry or, or something. It was really, it was fantastic. So yeah, yeah, it, it, total, a total kind of coming around again to yeah. To the, yeah. The, yeah. You know, one of the things uh, that I don't know a lot of uh, Hoyas know is that part of us getting you here as as, as being missioned to Georgetown was to um, to certify to the provincial that when you were being missioned, Georgetown was ready and able to land a contract for you outside of their normal contractual ways, right? Jesuits do things differently. So getting you to Georgetown with without kind of thinking about a three-year budget plan uh, it just causes so much havoc on the university. So one of the things that, that we have, and you were really uh, one of our first people to receive this, is this Jesuit Bridge Fund. Um, mm -hmm. And it's something that uh, Mission and Ministry and Advancement puts together to allow young Jesuits like yourself, just coming out of school, ready to kind of go, how do we give, the, give, that, give you three years of funding so that the university can um, recalibrate its budgets so that Jesuits, we don't lose a Jesuit because we don't have the funding. Because as you know, provincials are going to say, if you have a job for him, what's his salary? How's it going to help out the Jesuit community? All that kind of stuff. So, so kudos to uh, just getting the bridge fund started, and kudos to um, to you being one of our first uh, people to get um, that bridge fund. No, I, I'm so I'm so grateful for the for the donors to the bridge fund. I mean. They're, they're generous donors, and, and and you know our, our universities, I think, are are hungry to bring Jesuits to the university in all the different sectors of the university's life, whether that be in the classroom, in campus ministry, in residence life, in administration. But all of our universities are strapped, and and that's becoming only exacerbated throughout COVID. So to be able to have ger generous donors who also have that as a high priority. Who then are able to say to the university, we can we can help bridge this person into the university, such that then Georgetown. So in my case, with the consent of the Department of Theology and Religious Studies, after going through that interview process that I talked about a little bit, to be able to welcome me and to be able to say, here's what a good teaching loan will look like, but also here's time for you to do your research and your writing and your service and and really to allow all the training that I've had behind me these years as a Jesuit, and particularly as a doctoral student, to be able to flourish, it wouldn't be possible without those generous donations. So I'm profoundly grateful for them. And I know others, hopefully, uh, long after me will be as well. Amen. Amen. Thanks. So you arrived at, um, here uh, and, you know, we had Otto Hens on before. And there's been, you know, we're a Catholic and Jesuit university. And I think, you know, in my four years here, Peter, I feel like Georgetown has taken very seriously what this means and has tried to make explicit what maybe was implicit, you know, 50 years ago or even 25 years ago. Um, and I, I talked to a lot of parents and students, alumni, uh, and they always ask that question of, you know, uh, where do you see, how do you see Georgetown as a Catholic and Jesuit today? What, how do you see it lived out? Um, and is there places where you think it needs to kind of push to get more engaged? Mm -hmm. I, I think those are, are, are great questions. And, it, you know, in a word to say, how do I see it living out, being lived out here? I, I would say dynamically in, in an exciting fashion. I, in fact, literally minutes before this started, I ended teaching one of my classes and we were doing a brief theology of the church today to set us up for some further conversations we're gonna have throughout the semester. And one of the points I was trying to make is that the church's understanding of itself throughout history has grown, it's evolved, it's developed, it's taken a couple detours along the way, 
It's tried to remain faithful to the gospel, listening to the voice of the Spirit. I think the society is trying to do the same thing, to borrow a phrase from Vatican II, trying to yeah. respond to the signs of the times, you know, always taking its cues fundamentally from, from Scripture, from the Spirit. And at least for me, one of the ways that I see the church developing, the society developing here at Georgia today is I, I think of some of the vision of Pope Francis, which again, it, it's not that the, the Pope is some sort of a dictator that just says, this is exactly what the vision of the church is. Like the rest of us, the, the Pope is listening for the voice of the spirit, bringing it in to conversation with the gospel. But even just some lines that we were using today, I was, I was leaning on one of his earlier documents, Evangelii Gaudium, which he yeah. put out in 2013. Okay. He says things like, and, and I am quoting a little bit here. So an evangelizing community gets involved by word and deed in people's daily lives. It bridges distances. He, he, he talks about how the church's customs, its ways of doing things have to really be situated for the evangelization of the world. And it's not about self-preservation. Mm -hmm. And then he has a famous line, I want a church that's bruised, hurting, and dirty because it's been out on the streets. And I see at Georgetown an image of church, an articulation of the Society of Jesus that's doing those things, that's getting involved by word and deed in people's lives, that's not looking just for self-preservation, but is looking at how it can adapt to the reality of the circumstances around us. And at times it's getting bruised, it's getting hurt, it's getting dirty because it's getting involved in those things. And that can be messy, but in my experience, that's where Georgetown wants to be. It wants to be in the heart of that. And I see that in my colleagues, I see it in brother Jesuits such as yourself. I see it in our students. And, yeah. and for me, uh, the way that we're doing that, I go by going to the margins, by the work that we do here, I, I think it's authentic. I think it, what it is part of what it means to be Catholic and to be Jesuit today. Yeah, yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. There is, and there is that sense of a hunger there too. It's a different kind of question maybe about what faith is and how it might work with, especially with our students, right? Um, but that word hunger comes to mind sometimes. Not, not everyone, but there's this invitation to, to be fed on a deep, rich resource of, 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 of what is faith? What does it mean to be a human person? How can you flourish? with others and for others, you know, that men, women and men for others. Um, and, I, and I have to say, I, when I came four years ago, I was a little skeptical that all of the banners about what the, what, what's Georgetown, the spirit of Georgetown, but I've heard, I've heard students talk about core personalis. I've heard students talk about what we're gonna be as a community in diversity. Uh, I've, talk, I've heard students talk about a faith that does justice. So, um, so, you know, we always have more work to do and, and, and there, there is a kind of a, uh, a kind of a gravitational force to slow things down <laughs> with this. But there, at the same time, I, every single year, I'm just always renewed by that. And, and I've heard students talk about it, even to use something like Cure Personalis, not, not just talk about it, but also want to grow in their understanding of it. So, right. so, so be able to talk about Cure Personalis and say care of the whole person, but also hear back and say, yeah, you know, you know right, that's not a, just a Jesuit idea that we have, uh, you know, fundamentally, the, the Greeks are talking about something like this. Other great universities in this country care about the whole person. What does it mean to say kind of a tailor-made care for your situation, taking the time to get to know you? What exactly are, are your, what's your personality? What are your gifts that are happening right now? And to try to let those flourish. And they're open to hearing that and engaging it. So I think for them, it's not just the banners on the campus, that's baseline, but yeah. then using that. To, to move more deeply into things. Yeah, I agree, I agree. You know, uh, you got to come here though, with, uh, right in the, as COVID was hitting. So, I mean, my gosh, uh, what, a, what a way to, I mean, you, I know you've done really well with it, but can you maybe just talk about um, what was it like to pivot to uh, virtual learning platforms? And I think instead of being Jesuits, I kept on saying, we all, we all looked like we were monks in a monastery, you know, being closed right. on. Right. Um, but maybe say a little bit about what it meant for you. What has COVID meant for you and the kind of, a kind of closed world that, that it has created uh, as a Jesuit and as a professor. Yeah, when you said earlier that I came to Georgetown in September of 2019, it's like that feels like a million years ago. Right. I mean, as of the first day of this semester, so last Monday, I will have now spent more time teaching online at Georgetown than I have teaching in person. Uh -huh. And so that that is a, a strange feeling 
Um, you know, COVID's been hard. I, I think I may have told you when I moved into my room in the Jesuit residence, I'm here in my office now in New North, but this is the first semester that I've, I've really been doing something out of here since COVID began. And when I moved into my room in the Jesuit residence, I was this close to saying, I'm not gonna need a desk. I'll do my work in my office, don't worry about it. Well, thank God I had a desk put in there because I spent uh, the entirety of the second half of the spring and the whole fall semester teaching yeah. from right there. So, you know, it, it's it's been hard. It's been hard for students. I, I, I remember the first time I ever heard the word Zoom in this context was when I was defending my dissertation and one of my readers was in, based in Chicago and she wasn't able to come. And so she said, I'm gonna Zoom in. I, I didn't even know what she meant. And mm -hmm. now, of course, it's become part of our, our vocabulary. So right. it, it's been hard, but I, I really think there are some tremendous gifts to it. Now, I want to be clear. I think that those are gifts against the backdrop of it would be right. so much better if we were in a brick and mortar classroom together, of course. But I, I think there have been some really good aspects of it. So for me, trying to build community in a classroom. So one thing that's nice, and I, know, I don't know how other faculty use it, but the breakout room function in Zoom, one of the things that I think are great about it is if you ask people in a class to do, you know, pair sharing or small group, or something like that, well, they're almost always sitting in the same seats, very often sitting with their friends. And so you're hearing voices of people you already know, maybe you already think alike on some things. Breakout rooms are random. And so you're talking with all different people all the time. So I think that's something that's, that's kind of exciting. Um, I, I'm, in the, I'm near the end now. I spend my first two weeks, I ask every student to meet with me one-on-one -on -one for 20 minutes over mm -hmm. Zoom just to find out about them, how they're doing, a little bit about their story. I, I never did something like that when I was in the classroom. I, I mean, I was always open to it, but I didn't require it. But right. now, I, I mean, I'm starting to rethink what's it going to be like when we're back in brick and mortar because I love the opportunity to, I mean, talk about Cura Personalis. Yeah. really to be able to meet those students as individuals and kind of find out who they are, where they're coming from, sometimes literally in the world where they are. And just the way that people have such facility with technology now and to be able to have assignments that look different. Theology is a world where a lot of times it operates in papers. But I mean, you yourself, I mean, March 23rd, I'll repeat, you know, a filmmaker that, that there's, there's, there's ways to do our ministry, and I invite students to do it through podcasts, through visuals, whether that be video or some other form of art, through conversation with me. Those are all part of class now, where when I was in a classroom, they weren't. It was much more kind of traditional, let's do papers. And so it's kind of expanded my imagination a bit. Well, I have to say, after I finished the spring semester myself, I was putting together my fall uh uh, course, and I, I heard you say it at the uh, Wolfington dinner table that you were meeting with your students, like doing these like 30 minute things. It, and I would have never thought of it. So I immediately did that with my students. So I really, I learned from, that was one of the things I kind of learned is just that there are ways to kind of, of get to know your students through Zoom and, and not forever office hours are gonna be, you know, through Zoom. And oh, yeah. walking through my Healy Hall, you know, it's just a way for them to, on their time, they're right there. And I find that they're using office hours a lot more, so. When you meet with your students in that context, how do they react when you tell them, Peter Follin gave me this great idea? You know, I, I forgot to tell them that part. I will say this, I think one of the one of the hidden graces of, uh, of the pandemic for the Jesuit community is that we've spent so much more time with each other. Yes. We spend time eating together, drinking together, watching uh, films together, um, going on walks together. Uh, that there's a sense that I think it rejuvenated in me, for me uh, the importance of community life. And I'm sure people who have, have had that same experience in their own personal families, right? My kids are with me, we're all working from home. Uh, there's a sense that you just kind of have a new appreciation for the calling of, of your vocation. I think that's absolutely right. And, and one of the real rich parts about a Jesuit community like ours, which has to be 30 something people, maybe about 40 people, is that when you're sitting down to have dinner each night, you, I mean, I almost never sit with the same exact permutation of people because there's so many different people right. that you could sit with. And so, and so that's nice. It mixes up conversations a bit, but I, I agree with you hundred percent that especially uh, when I've come here, I've lived in Washington, two different times before, once right when I was out of college, and then my first year as a priest, I was at Holy Trinity. So I know some people here, and you get busy with work, and you meet new people, 
it, it's sometimes easy to not be around a Jesuit community as much. But we have been around a lot. And, and one of the fruits that's come out of that is getting to know the guys better and really appreciate them that much more in a variety of apostolates, as you well know, of course, across Washington, not just Georgetown University. Yeah, that's great. You know, you're um, we kind of want to move into what you do as a theologian, as a scholar. And you, you do research in the Catholic, Catholic, Catholic Lutheran doctrine, excuse me, and the history right. of that, that, um, that relationship. And for me, it seems, you know, that was almost ready made for Georgetown, right? So when we saw yeah. what your scholarship was, it really fit into Georgetown, right? We mm -hmm. are a place of ecumenism and interreligious dialogue, and we want to be intellectually deep and rich in our thinking and our dialogue. So mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about what motivates your scholarship? And um, and again, I love that term by Pope Francis, walking ecumenism, you know? Yeah, isn't that great? Yeah. Yeah, we have to walk together on that. Yeah, I, I mean, for me, I would, I, I suppose if I looked at some of the, the deeper roots, I'd probably go back to that year that I was at Holy Trinity. You know, any, any authentic theology comes from an experience of God and of the people of God. And so I was at Holy Trinity, first year priest, almost every day I presided at the Eucharist or at a penance service or anointing the sick or something like that. So I was constantly immersed in scripture, which I absolutely loved. And then I went to do a doctorate in theology and it wasn't in biblical theology. And we almost never talked about the Bible. <laughs> and I had spent time studying Greek and Hebrew and all this stuff along the way in the society. And so for me, kind of the or question was, how do we bring these two into deeper conversation with one another? How can scripture be used more integrally in theological reflection? Which, which if you're watching this and, and you, you're not you know, a theologian, you might think, well, isn't that exactly what you do? And there are sectors of theology where that happens. Sure. But I wasn't finding that driving my, my coursework. And so that really became kind of a, a research interest for me. And, and one area that through some good conversations with some wonderful mentors that I, I wound up thinking about was something called the doctrine of justification, which is something that has biblical roots largely in Paul's letters. It's a, one of the motifs that the New Testament uses to talk about salvation, but it was a huge sticking point to say the very least of in the 16th century of a conflict between Catholics and Lutherans. And so, what really started it for me was to say, well, how does scripture play a role in this? How did the Bible play a role in the division, different ways of reading scripture? And then how did it play a role in the rapprochement between Catholics and Lutherans, which again, is a little inside baseball, but 1999, major agreement signed between the two on the doctrine of justification. So for me, and we can kind of get out of the nitty gritty of some of that, but it's really asking the question of how can scripture be used more integrally because that's really what's at the heart of ecumenism. That's a source that all Christians are going back to. Catholics might very happily make reference to the Second Vatican Council as I did earlier in this conversation, which is so significant, but someone who is a Presbyterian will not look at Vatican II in the same way that a Catholic would. But there is a regard, certainly a, a, a reverence for scripture and so to say how, how can we kind of use this more and i i think that ecumenism is still alive and well that you'll hear the phrase every once in a while we're in an ecumenical winter because very often there's more interest in uh, interreligious dialogue learning about non-christian faiths which is so significant and i'm blessed to be in a department where we have so many scholars of non-christian faiths as well but I, I mean i think of a need for ecumenical dialogue as well i mean to you know, come up with something that is is a, a horrible stain on our country recently. Look at the events of the 6th of January. Many people coming with, with feeling that this is Christianity that is motivating me uh, in some way to do this. So how is there dialogue there with different ways of appropriating the gospel? So I actually think there's a tremendous need for it now. And I think Georgetown is a site where that can happen in a unique way that it can at many of our other institutions. Yeah, and that's, yeah, it, that does bring it home. The way that um, Christianity has been so kind of almost demarcated and ideologized, you might say, into different categories. Um, even, even at Georgetown, I talked to some kids who said, why do you call it Protestant ministry, Father? And I said, uh, it was, and, and they said, I said, well, because, you know, the Protestant tradition, I, I thought he was, he was looking for a big explanation. He says, well, I'm just Christian. 
I mean, so for him, right. he, I didn't know. He didn't know whether he was Lutheran or Baptist. Or he just goes to this Christian church, right? Well, and it just right. it reminded me of how much I have to keep myself engaged with the ways in which this Christian community, Catholic and 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 and, and Protestant, is bigger than or Orthodox for that matter. But how we even use the language and how we we walk with, with each other. So it is it's, it's eye opening to see how the students who are who are committed to Christ come with with so many different kinds of assumptions. And and where can we as, be assumed together and where where do we have to kind of deconstruct and where do we have to reconstruct a kind of of, of walking ecumenism yeah right so some some uh, terms that sometimes will get used in ecumenical dialogue is is how to avoid a, a confessionalism where mm -hmm. it's just you know catholicism is the only thing that matters and and who cares about any other christian well hold on a second versus also just wanting to say that, well, well, there is nothing particular about my confession. Well, how do you kind of yeah. navigate between those two things? So I want to honor the history of, of other Christian communions. And of course, my work with uh, Lutheranism is, is going to be, that's always at the fore of my mind. And not just to say this is some kind of generic other thing happened. And I think that's why, to use the term you brought up before from the Pope, walking ecumenism is so significant. It, it's walking with other people in their lives. It, and the best of ecumenical dialogue today is not about let's sit down at the table, you know, gird our loins and come, you know, loaded for bear and start fighting over doctrines. It's right. to say, how can we engage one another in prayer, in service, in a common respect for scripture? And, and what can we bring out of this? That's how that joint declaration from 1999 that I spoke about earlier. That's how that came about. That was the methodology, walking with people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I, I do think there's a, what I do love about Georgetown, and I think it's the theology department, it's the campus ministry, the way it's set up with different chaplains who always are walking together. I mean, you don't see, you don't see people siloed, uh, not in departments, nor in, in even campus ministry. We like to say, you know, that, that every check captain, whether you're the imam or you're the or you're the Methodist minister or the Baptist minister, you're the minister for all students, whether they're Baptist, or anybody who wants to come to you, you're part of that community, and uh, I think it's really important. Um, and it's it's the case, right, that one of your I would guess one of your last flights was uh, to and from the Holy Land with a group here, precisely that, an interreligious and also an ecumenical group about about a year ago, right? It was. We came back on January. We came back to upon on January six, Epiphany um, of all things. Okay. Okay. Um, and it was. That's right. It was. Uh, it was three self-identified Muslim professors and, and staff and administrators, uh, six self-identified Jewish, and the rest Christian with with a heavy dose of Catholic in that in that group. Mm -hmm. uh, and yep. It really was a. It was a profound experience of sharing and walking with each other. Um, and so much learning, uh, especially if I think for the Christians, to be honest with you, uh, to be in both Palestine and in Israel, to be meeting mm -hmm. different varieties of people, and then to witness it through the eyes of our chaplains and our and our faculty to kind of share. It. Yeah, we're going to be doing a new. Uh, nice. We're going to be starting, and I know you want to be part of this, Peter. We're going to try to do a campus. I know what you're going to say. I want to be a part of it. The civil rights pilgrimage. We're going to kind of do Martin Luther King's, you know, where he started in Alabama to Atlanta and take students and faculty to really kind of do a kind of a, a deep dive and, and a kind of a pilgrimage kind of sense of walking, literally walking in the footsteps of our history of civil rights and where we are today. So um, those are going to be really exciting things too. And yeah. I think students are excited about that as well. I mean, it, it, it's, yeah. it's, it's relevant. It's now. It's our finger on the pulse of things and then reacting to it. That's what I'm talking about before. That's what Pope Francis is talking about with the church, getting yeah. into what's real right now. Yeah, cool. So we, you know, part of the title of this is about, you know, the problem of God. So we have to go there. And, and, and obviously, yeah. you probably remember what we had Otto Pence on in the springtime. Uh, and we talked about sure. the kind of creation of the problem of God at that moment and how it became a signature course and how Otto actually became a signature professor in some ways. Mm -hmm. that course for over 40 years. Um, the course has evolved, right? Uh, it's involved generations of Hoyas who have taken it. Um, it it's, it's involved new professors trying to embrace it, engage it. So you're you're now in your second year teaching Problem of God. Um, and, and we're really hoping that you are, no offense, Peter, you're the new Otto Hens of Problem of God, right? <laughs> so, oh, boy, that'd be fantastic. Yeah. So, um, but could you say why you think it's important to Georgetown's educational enterprise today? 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a it's a fantastic course. I mean, I think one of the huge things it's got going for it is the name, because the yeah. name almost never fail. I mean, you and I just were on an email yesterday from an alumnus who was talking about his experience with the problem of God. The name almost never fails to make an impression, even when people who aren't aren't at all affiliated with Georgetown will ask me, "Well, what do you teach?" And I say theology. And they say, "What are the names of the courses?" And I say, "The problem of God." And they, oh, the problem. This is when is God as a problem? Only the Jesuits could think of God as a problem. Okay, okay, I understand. So, I, I, but hey, if if a course has that kind of buzz after being on the books for 50 something years, you're doing something right. And so kind of the way I approach it, and of course, I'm sure almost everybody who's watching this, if not everybody knows, these are named after lectures that the Jesuit John Courtney Murray delivered in 1962 at Yale University, where he's really trying to make the argument that God is a problem for every generation. Now, he has something very particular in mind with that. And, and with my class, we read the introduction to these lectures. He uses a, a strong phrase there that it, it's the kind of problem that takes you by the throat, or I say, you know, grabs you by the lapels. It, it's something you can't get around. You have to, you have to deal with it, that God's mm -hmm. going to confront you one way or another. And, and that's what he means by it. It doesn't mean a problem as in something you wish wouldn't have happened to you, like if I get a, you know, a flat tire as a problem. That's not what he means. Right. And so he talks about the ways it came to Israel and the way that problem is, is God really going to be for us as we're wandering here in the wilderness, having escaped Egypt? How it came about in patristic and scholastic times, really, what's the essence of God? How does, how does the Father relate to the Son, the Son to the Spirit, the Spirit to the Father? And then even in things like in the late 19th, early 20th century, uh, the God is dead movement, when we say we've kind of killed God in our society. So for me, the question is, how is God grabbing us kind of by the throat today, by the lapels, whatever image you want to use? And one of the ways that I try to approach it in my class now is by using what, what, what I call God talk. So words that might come from mm -hmm. our experience of God. And what do those words mean? Have they lost some of their meaning? How can we bring back some of their meaning and, and understand historically what they mean? And then apply them to our world today. So one of the reasons why I'd be so interested in this pilgrimage is this year especially, I pivoted in the way I did Problem of God to use those theological resources that we built up to then look at the sin of racism. Mm -hmm. And to try to see something, that, not, not to resolve it, and that's certainly not going to be possible for a class, but to be able to look at this and to say, how can we use some of these categories, concepts to understand this more fully and to try to become people who stand against it? Yeah. Yeah, it's so interesting because um, I think that word problem is, you're right, it, there's something so key to that, to that word. Because you think about the 20th century, you think about the post-enlightenment, you think about a, a century that saw two world wars, two different holocausts, you know, atomic holocaust and the Jewish holocaust. Um, you, you, you just, you see where, you know, the whole God is dead movement. Where is God? Where is God? And so God is, God is a problematic of, of a kind of modern consciousness, not a given, you know? Um, yes. At the same time, I like how you talked about it. With, with the way that Murray talks about it, is that it's almost as if, but God is going to hound you. He's not. You, you just can't get away from it. It's going to come back, uh, and it's going to. It's going to either, no offense to the hound of heaven, it's going to either bite you in the rear end, or you That's can actually, right. <laughs> you can actually face this and, and do it in an intellectually and spiritually deep manner. Right. And, and, you know, he ends that uh, ends the introduction. I love the way he ends it. He says basically, if God is then the one thing that can never be permitted is to say God is not. And if God is not, the one thing that can never be permitted is to say that God is. He said, but either way, and I'm changing some of his language, he's using some sexually exclusive terms in 1962, but he says, either way, no person can say that the problem of, that God is not that person's problem. In other words, you can't keep a distance from it. He says, it's not like a problem in a lab where you want to have some distance. I don't want my personality to get into this chemistry experiment. That's not what it's about. But he's saying quite the contrary for God. And and, and I think that's, first of all, I think it's true. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's exciting. And I think it allows that course to meet people wherever they are. And even again, in that introduction, Murray says, look, the purpose of these is not to be you engage in uh, apologetic, it's not to engage in polemic. It's not to engage in proof. 
but it is to engage in something historical, descriptive, and I say something critical as well. How can we make judgments about some of these things? And so I, I find by and large students react well to the course, e even those who might come in. And I see a little bit of this in those one-on-one 20-minute -on -one conversations that are making clear to me in their own way that I'm, I'm doing this because the university is making me do it. But <laughs> as St. Ignatius says, in, in their door to go out your door. Hopefully. Yeah, absolutely, I know. And I do think, and usually, for, it, from all evidence, and it's all anecdotal, but you know, I travel in my job as mission and ministry to so many alumni and saying mass in different cities, having dinners and stuff. People, and I'm for, you know, I'm a, I'm a senior in, in the college, you might say, I'm only in my fourth year. And, and the one more. that I can start a conversation with is, so who did you have for a problem of God? And you know, it's just an incredible thing. You might start the course saying, ah, oh, this is, you know, I'm only doing this because I have to. But the transformation happens through conversation, through the reading, through the grappling, through the kind of, like, I'm, I'm going to have to chew on this, right? And then it's also then kind of played out with another three, because most most students, don't you think, take it in freshman year? Yes, yes, most yeah. would take it their first year, yeah. It was played out in different ways, so that there's like almost little like little time bombs that go off in your in your intellectual and moral life when you're a sophomore, junior, or senior, say, oh yeah, I remember, like, that's what, that's what we, we talked about in the problem of God, or all of a sudden it becomes in, incarnated and fleshed in a, in a relationship or in a choice that has to be made where, oh, it's a bigger thing than just, you know, a, a superficial kind of reality. And, and I think that's one of the reasons why we would urge people to take not just the problem of God or whatever they might want to use to fulfill their first theology requirement. You can also take the introduction to biblical literature, but take it early on. But indeed, more broadly, the whole idea behind the core curriculum yeah. is to say, you know, the goal of having people take the problem of God is not to make everybody a theology and religious studies major. You're all welcome. I mean, come on in. We'd love to have you. But the goal is to say, how can we build this foundation for your time at Georgetown in theology, in philosophy, in history, in the sciences, in language, in literature, and thus let those inform the question and maybe even give rise to the questions that you're going to be asking in a particular discipline in which you're going to specialize across all of Georgetown schools, whether yeah. it's in the college or an MSB or in the School of Foreign Services or in the nursing health school. So how are you going to let these these courses, these fundamental core courses, form your education here. And that's why I think it's so significant to have them here at the beginning. Yeah, and, and, and what's really cool is that the problem of God almost sets up the situation that our pedagogy is Christian humanism. How, how, do, we make, how do we make you the deepest, uh, uh, most caring human being for whatever vocation you have in your life. And so the liberal arts, I mean, Jesuits, we're, we're known, artists, places are known for that. All of these things, history, English, art, uh, theology, philosophy, um, the sciences, all of these, all these larger questions kind of can be encapsulated in that word problem, I think, you know, it, like I had to, I had to deal with it. And I think what, what I find most interesting is that by the time students leave here, and when I talk to alumni, problem is, they, they, they just accept that there's mystery in their life. And it goes from problem to mystery. And I think that's what's so neat about it because they think that, okay, we have to solve this problem. And yet I think they realize, oh, I'm very complicated as a human being. <laughs> yeah, oh, I, very, very, I, I, I'm up and down on this. You know, there's a mystery to the fact of our humanity. And I think that the course kind of says, okay, let's just throw down the gauntlet, you know, at it. Yeah, and I'm even thinking, you're just kind of on my my feet here as I as I sit down as you're saying some of that. Yeah, in a way, problem is great, you know, it, it, almost on a first pass because yeah. you know we have extremely talented students here who love to kind of get into a problem and how do I solve it? And if it starts in problem and ends in mystery, you know, you know as well as I do that that root of the word mystery, that Greek root muo, which is just yeah. I am silent, yeah. I'm rendered silent before something, before a great mystery. Right. Um, there, if we, we can move people there, boy, that's that's tremendous. But to start a course called the Mystery of God might might be less appeal. Certainly not going to generate as much cocktail party conversation as the problem of God. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I, and it's true because I've I've asked sometimes these, especially kids who have just graduated. I said, have you ever used the problem of God as a as a conversation starter when you're at a party? And they, ha ha ha, hi, very very funny, father. But I'm telling you. It is a conversation starter, and we've actually gotten anecdotes from many, many Hoyas over the years. Um, oh, absolutely. 
so we have a, just a couple minutes because we're going to go to questions. Um, but okay. you know, in, in, uh, if there was some, if there was one message, you know, we've we've now gone. In, we're in our third semester. We're in COVID nineteen semester three point um, We've we've been a, a community in dispersion among our students. It's we're trying to be spiritually connected, communally connected through virtual ways. We've had to we've had to really um, disappoint a lot of of people because we could not be together because of the, the pandemic. So if there's a if there's a message you'd want to get across to every Hoya or every alum that just might help ground them back into those set that those essential values of being a woman or a man for others as we begin the year. Um, is there anything you like to offer? What would you say to them? Yeah, you know, one one thing that's been kicking around in my mind a little bit lately, I had the mass at, at Dahlgren two nights ago, and uh, I, I guess I'm going to kind of quote myself here. This is a very Jesuit thing to very quote Jesuit. myself. But, <laughs> but as I was preparing my homily, I was reminded of the George Bernard Shaw play, St. Joan. I don't know if you know that one. It's about Joan of Arc. It's a, it's a great play. And, and at one point, Joan is saying that she's uh, been given this message by God to to do what she's about to do. And those who are questioning her say, uh, you know, little girl, that's that's just your imagination. And she says, well, of course it's my imagination. How else do you think God would talk to me? And and, and I, I guess if I had one message, and I, I think this would be kind of an Ignatian spin on this, maybe imagination as well, but really desires. You know, if there's one thing that COVID has kind of opened up, maybe it's a little bit of time, maybe even sometimes silence if we're not around people as much as, or at least a little bit more quiet. What's going on in my desires? What are the things I keep coming back to in my desire? Maybe another word we could put in there. If Joan used dream, uh, imagination, I might say dreams also. Yeah. What, what am I excited about? And especially now as I kind of have some longitudinal look at this time because it is semester 3.0, what keeps coming back? Mm -hmm. It's not just ephemeral there one day and gone the next, but it's still moving in me. And I know that can seem like, oh, that's so contemplative. And you asked the question about, how can you be men for others, men and women for others? So that's really about action. Well, well no, I mean, I, I do think it's very Ignatian to start there. What are my desires? So if, if there's one message that I could get, it's to say, pay attention to what those desires, those dreams are, and especially if they have staying power. And to wonder, just like Joan said, well, how else do you think God is going to speak to you? It ain't right. going to be a voice like you're hearing mine. And and so that at least, and believe me, as I say it, that's something I'm thinking about. That's my own medicine that I'm trying to take as well. So that's great, Peter. It's really, and, it, and it's very Ignatian. You're right. It's, it goes back to the fact that our desires um, are for us. They're, 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 they're places where God meets us. Um, and uh, if we give ourselves the time, the quiet, and you're right, you're absolutely right. COVID has done that for so many of us. Um, so, well, good. I, I, yeah. I really appreciate that. And we're going to have a couple questions now from, um, from the, the group here. Uh, this, the first one is a, uh, one, it looks like it's still on the problem of God. Um, how have you as a theology professor, especially teaching the problem of God, helped students understand the work of God, especially in a time of pandemic? Have you pivoted at all, either within your syllabus or in discussion as a result of the pandemic, I guess? Yeah, I, I, I've not um, had a lot of uh, explicitly pandemic-related uh, readings or anything like that, but I, but I think that the way I kind of organize uh, my course and thinking about words like sin and justice and holiness and mercy, those would be the kind of four basic words I talked about, uh, God talk, and so how we can bring that to bear on a question of the pandemic, both in terms of how we, we care for one another, that the justice isn't just giving each person his or her due. Justice is, is having, uh, again, grounded, especially in all the scriptures, but especially in the Hebrew scriptures, a preferential option for those who are poor, for those who are most susceptible to this disease. I mean, we're seeing a lot of this now, and we think about vaccine mm -hmm. lists and who should be brought up when and what's just and can I jump the line and, and those sorts. So I think the way those questions are being raised right now are, are things that I bring especially into problem of God uh, because they're fundamental now. It's what people are experiencing. Um, people experiencing things that they might want to do something, but they can't do it. The idea of the common good yeah. What do I, you know, most of the time, let's say pre-COVID, my individual good might very well uh, coalesce and even help buttress 
the common good that I, I want to go out for dinner somewhere and I do that. I'm going to enjoy that with my friends. I'm also contributing to the economy. That's great. Well, now a lot of times individual good and common good are, are coming into conflict. If I want to go out and, and do X and you know, associate with any number of different people and then I come back to the Jesuit residence, that, that's not contributing to that common good. And so what do we do when those things come into to conflict with one another? So I'm trying to bring those questions mm. uh, to the students in a, in a variety of different ways. And I'm, I'm always trying to look, make some move back to where we are right now. And I'd say the two that I keep going to, the one I go to more is to look at the way the questions of racism in our country have been re-raised. It's not for the first time they're raised, right. but have been brought up anew but then also the COVID, uh, COVID vaccine and the COVID pandemic generally? Yeah, what, the, that's a great question. Racism especially. I mean, not, not, not that we have to bring Flannery O'Connor in here one more time, but um, I, I think Flannery O'Connor, she has this idea of, that we're all uh, people with some privilege, the people who go to Georgetown are privileged to go to, you know, we all are always recovering from our racism. We think that, oh, I've done it, okay, I'm no longer a racist, I'm, but, but we're always recovering in, in the daily actions, in the deeper kind of movements, the deeper commitments we have. And you're absolutely right. And there's, there's a, lot, a, a lot of us need to remember, not only remember that, but just make that part of our aspect of, of, our, of our exam and our examination of who we are. And I think it's a deeply ecclesial instinct as well. I mean, you know as well as I do that one of the phrases that will attach to the church is semper reformanda. It's yeah. always reforming right. it, it, because it's always looking to be more faithful to the gospel and the yeah. witness that one can bear to it is not always perfect such that we put a bow on it and we're done. What does it right. look like now? How does that, how does it, how do we become more dynamic in that? Or to use a Jesuit term, magis. And so yeah. I, I think that's very much at the heart of it. it. It's in other words, it's a deeply ecclesial instinct as well. Mm, nice, nice. Um, given our conversation, someone asked if you could confirm the name of the 1962 uh, lecture at Yale that um, John Courtney Murray did. Was it just called The Problem of God? It was called the. So it was a series of three lectures that he gave. So I have the students read the introduction. I don't want to stand up and walk out on the screen, but I assure you it's right on my bookshelf right there. And if I opened it up, I could show you. It says in there, Peter Folan, Fall 1999, because I had to buy it when I was a senior in college, not even <laughs> at a Jesuit school. <laughs> and so I had to read it then. But he offers three different lectures. So I just have them read the intro. But the first one is about the first epoch he talks about, which is the time of the Exodus. And then the second is he, he spans quite a bit of time from the patristic age, which would be around you know, the time of Augustine. So we're talking the fourth into the fifth century up through scholasticism. So about the 13th, 14th century. So really a period of about a thousand years, which if, if we know some church history is kind of those early centuries is when we're ironing out some of the Trinitarian and Christological controversies right. all up through the great Sume of most famously Thomas Aquinas. And then the third lecture is dealing with the late 19th into the early 20th century. And one of his points, I think, is that in each of these, God was a problem, something that had to be confronted, but in a different way. Yeah. Israel is asking, are you going to just leave us here? in the wilderness. The patristics and the scholastics are asking, who exactly are you? And in the 19th into the 20th century, it's we, we now have a world in which we've killed you and you're not even here. And, and of course, is, he's painting with broad brushes. He has a great line in the intro. He says, don't expect the brush strokes of a Mandarin. You know, mm -hmm. really fine brush strokes. And I'm gonna be painting with some broad brush strokes here. And so I, I would think if you were to Google the problem of God, John Courtney Murray, you would see the book. And I believe, and I don't know if we can send this out afterwards, I, I think we may have all of those links to all of those lectures uh, available, maybe even through our own library. Yeah, I think uh, so. I'm not sure about that, but. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure we do in the, in, in, with, in the lab for sure. Uh, and it might actually, yeah. it might even be linked actually into some of our website, university website stuff, just talking about it. But we, that's, a good, that's good for us to kind of um, uh, think about. You know, what I love about it also, what you were just saying is that, you know, it reminds us that uh, the character of God changes with the character of the people he's trying to call into relationship, you know. And so I love the fact that in some ways in this Christian tradition, we can, we can say maybe more metaphorically, but with some truth to it, God develops in how he has to deal with us. <laughs> you know, like he learns something. Oh, this that this didn't work. This big flood with Noah didn't work. I'll have to try something else, you know. Oh, David, oh, you know what? That the kings, the kingdom just didn't work, and I'll try something else. And of course, Christ 
as a kind of, you know, the apex or the, the climactic moment of, ah, this will work. That, that sure. We it, yeah, or, or, or even, um, you know, I, I've, I've had professors use the image before that sometimes people can be one club golfers, that every time you reach into the bag, you pull out the same club, people can react the same way, proceed in their, their jobs or whatever, be one club golfer. God is the antithesis of the one club golfer. God's got every club in the bag and can and will use the you know the right club for the right situation, so to speak. Right. And, and so we'll, we'll speak tenderly sometime to Israel and call Israel back as we start to you know you look at like the beginning of of the book of Hosea or something, which we're going to start to see parts of during Lent. Say, so I'm going to I'm going to seduce her. I'm going to bring her back. I'm going to speak lovingly to her. Other times in other books, Isaiah. You look at Isaiah one. Say, I am disgusted by your festivals and 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 again that that's talking to the whole people of God and, and including us today it, it, and so God's giving us what we need when we need it that in some ways is a good handy definition of 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 grace kind of a low level definition but you're right yeah. and so in that sense we could look at those three periods talked about in the problem of God in the same fashion Cool. We have, a, we have a, a, an alum who said that he took the problem of God with Otto, Father Hent, and he still talks about the course <laughs> like everyone else. Um, he says he never forgets having read uh, an essay called Auschwitz as Revelation uh, mm. and he discussed it. I, I have not read that um, myself. And, but he said it's, it, it was a way for him to understand how we might talk about God in, in modernity and God in modern times. Are the, he says, could you speak us about any of the uh, more to any, how you bring this concept of modernity, I guess, or the sense of this, this this 20th century, 21st century moment into the approach of your of, of the problem of God? Yeah, and, and I think that's important. And in some ways, the question also makes me think about uh, a course I taught last semester on divine revelation. So this, this kind of fundamental theological concept that God reveals God's self to human beings. And, and what, what will I'll be uh, talked about sometimes is uh, in, in negative or in contrast experiences. So sometimes we think about God who is love revealing God's self and we think, boy, this is just, God is gonna be present in the, the joys of my life, the things I'm giving deep gratitude for. But then there can also be times when we're really being able to sense God's presence most profoundly in the valleys of our lives, in the sadnesses of our lives. And I, I, I haven't read the essay, but I presume that is part of what's being discussed in this essay, which is talking about Auschwitz as revelatory. Obviously not revelatory, meaning a good thing in some objective way, but a site where God shows God's self to be on the side of the person who is discriminated against, who is hated, who is outcast. I mean, I think the way some of that is brought into the problem of God, I'll just use one text, for instance, that I've read with students last semester and this semester is the work of James Cone, who is a black Christian theologian, not Catholic, and it's called the cross and the lynching tree. He, he would really be seen, I think, as the father of black liberation theology. But uh, he, he writes this wonderful book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree. And, and fundamentally, he's asking the question, how does so much of Christian theology in the early to mid and even to the late 20th century, by the time he writes the book, he writes in the 21st century, focus on the cross as being such a significant symbol in that rich sense of the word symbol of the Christian life, but doesn't make the connection with the lynching tree. And I think back even to my own education growing up. I mean, I, I don't know how much I learned about lynching when I was in high school in the in the early 1990s. I mean, I was in high school in Long Island. I don't know how much this was talked about. I knew what the term meant. I didn't know how widespread it was or anything like that. And right. and so to 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 read Cone's words, I think to to respond to the question that was asked is very much kind of bringing that question in to conversation with modern experiences of evil, of injustice the problem of evil, how we can, a theodicy to use a technical term, how we can talk about God existing, being a good and a powerful God in the midst of these negative contrast experiences uh, like Auschwitz, like the lynching tree. But also it doesn't have to be of that massive scope. It could be of our own lives, suffering that we're having right now. And, and that for me is also a, a key part of this course. Right. Yeah, I think one of the things that the Catholic and Jesuit tradition has always stressed is that suffering is a site for engagement with God, encounter with God, uh, and we, we can't run away from it. I mean, we can, we can try, um, but that in some ways we're, we are drawn every liturgical year 
to Good Friday uh, so that we can understand and feel the the, the quality and the and the transformation of Easter, right? Um, and I think that that's one of the things that I think an intellectual grasp of theology for our for our undergrads especially allows for is that it's not just these doctrines, you know, it's not yeah. just it's this is it's a dramatic kind of engagement with a, something transcendent that you are you are part of that mystery. You're engaged with that, including where you suffer, where you will see suffering uh, in the world. And, and I think it's always important to hasten to add that it's not that God is ordaining the suffering. God's not desiring the suffering. God's not getting a kick out of the suffering. But right. so, the, the lover will suffer. The one who loves will suffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, great German Christian theologian executed by the Nazis, says when Christ calls a person, he says man. When Christ calls a man, when Christ calls a person, Christ bids that person to come and die. Uh, not because Christ is a sort of bloodlust. But because that's what a real living of the gospel looks like. It's going to bring suffering. It's it's going to bring that. But in that, there can be something revel that not can be. There will be something revelatory as well. Yeah, yeah. You know, a, a good question that was raised is the problem of God is not just taught by the Jesuits or the Catholic uh, Christian um, theologians, but it's taught really by all the faith traditions. Uh, is it, is, are there are there are some philosophy professors I think teaching the problem of God as well. Is that right, or is it all theology? There may I, I'm new enough that I'm not sure the whole roster. Certainly, the minority of professors statistically are Jesuits. Um, how that would break down denominationally, for for sure, there's professors, many professors who teach who are not Christians. Yeah. So, so there uh, may anything, be philosophers also. Anything that you hear just from being in the department with your your, your colleagues, uh, what are some of their? I mean, what are some of those approaches? Just to give some examples, that'd be a good way to kind of maybe uh, circle around how this is not just a Catholic thing or a Christian thing. I think one of the beauties of the problem of God course is that there are a variety of sections. I mean, last section, I, the last semester, I think I taught section number 26. So I can guarantee there were at least 26 sections. There are probably more than that. And each of them is going to be relatively particular to the instructor. So there's no syllabus we all have to follow. There's no set of texts we have to read. Some people would uh, not consider that a blessing. That's another conversation for another day. But one <laughs> of the things that I think, at least for this particular question, is good about it is it really encourages professors to use their areas of expertise to address this problem of God. And so people will come at it from a variety of religious perspectives. Many will treat it as an opportunity for to explore religious pluralism, world religions. Others will do a deep dive, let's say, on some of the things we've just been talking about, say the problem of evil. Others will come at it from a more philosophical perspective and maybe engage in many texts that talk about proofs of the existence of God and things like that. So in other words, I, I think for sure one could say is an advantage of it, at least theoretically, but potentially so, is that it allows students to kind of have a variety of on-ramps to yeah. these questions as opposed to saying, you gotta be coming in from a Christian perspective. And I, I, at least what I was taking from my colleagues is the invitation is you wanna you want really let students tap into where your expert and where your passions are. And that's gonna be the way that we all kind of get onto that same road and be moving forward with what I think ultimately are many, many similar questions across the sections, even if we're not explicitly intending to be that. Right. Well, wow. well, you know the Healy bells here uh, in my office. I'm here, here. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the uh, Angelus bells are. So we know we're at our, our end. But we also know it's a minute before. There was one last question that someone asked. Just what? What are you as a Jesuit reading right now or watching right now? That'd be a nice kind of way to end this a, on a, maybe a lighter note than the problem of God. You know, what are you okay, anything, yes. enjoying reading or, or anything you're watching on TV? So I'll, I'll mention a couple things. So i have uh, let's see. I'm reading. I just read for a course last semester. I, I read it prior to the course and I've been kind of going back to it. Alice McDermott's The Ninth Hour. She's a novelist. She's from Long Island, from New York. It's a great. I got it on Audible actually, and then I got a free credit. So I also got Barack Obama's A Promised Land. And <laughs> you know that I'm a big Marilyn Robinson fan, a novelist. She wrote a trilogy, Gilead, Home, and Lila. She's just yeah. written a fourth book in it, so it's no longer a trilogy, Jack. So I'm looking to read that. And in terms of watching, I'm watching something all, not all that sophisticated right now. I'm watching the series on Netflix, La Casa de Papel. I think it's translated money heist. And it's, it's, it's not very deep. But I'll tell you what I want to watch is because a bunch of Jesuits have been talking about it, is this anthology by Steve McQueen called Small Axe. 
Yeah. I think it's five different movies. So I haven't seen any of them. I think it's on Amazon. So, so right, that's yeah. next on my queue. Yeah, How about very- you? Do we have time to hear what you're doing? Well, I just finished reading uh, Graham Greene's The U- the Unquiet. Oh, was, Graham Greene. What a shock. This is wonderful. <laughs> Graham Greene, of course. Um, and right now, um, I'm not really watching any. Oh, I'm watching this Lupin, L-U-P-I-N. It's a, oh, yeah. a French Netflix thing. So it's it's been pretty good. It's kind of detective and uh, espionage, all that stuff. So, well, listen, the Fantastic. bells are actually ringing right now. We can both hear them. I want to thank you, Peter, um, for, uh, for taking Thanks, the Mark. time this this conversation i want to thank all of our uh, hoyas uh, and, and friends out there who have listened in um you know this has been part of the legacy of georgetown this this problem of god and and i'm just so glad that we have um we, we we've really seen it kind of fr- through otto's eyes we've now seen it through peter's eyes and uh that's really wonderful and i ask you ever all of you to join us again at the next one uh in a couple of weeks though another conversation with jesuits we're looking at some of the new jesuits who are here on campus who are part of this uh, intellectual and uh, uh, pastoral community. All right, signing off then. Ciao, ciao. Uh, thanks, thanks, Peter. Bye, everybody. Right. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.